Welcome to Indoctrination, a weekly conversation series about protecting yourself from systems of control. I'm your host, Rachel Bernstein. Thank you so much for all of the support that you have given the podcast and all of the incredible reviews and the feedback. And it really has been completely gratifying and heartwarming. And I'm so happy to hear from all of you. Please let me know if the podcast has had an impact on you or go to iTunes or anywhere where you can write a review if you feel like it's been helpful to you. Let me know. Let people know. And thank you also for the people who have supported the podcast in other ways. I want to make sure to give a shout out to the people who give $10 or more per month on Patreon. And if you would like to get a shout out and become a Patreon subscriber for $10 or more, it'd be much appreciated because I pay for this out of pocket. And so go to patreon.com slash indoctrination. And now for the shout outs. Thank you very much to Alex and to Anne and Richard, Brianna, Camus, Christina, James, Katrina, Ken, Lillian, Linda, Maureen, Paul and Paula, Cynthia and Peter, Scott and Sylvia and Bert. I could not do this without you. Thank you, thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm very happy you're going to be able to hear part two of my conversation with Hannah Watkins. Hannah was born into an organization called the Move of God, and she spent the first 18 years of her life in that religious organization. In the time since she has left, she has learned to value the sense of family and community she was raised in, while also seeing how damaging and dangerous extreme adherence to restrictive religious beliefs can be, especially for young girls. She also, in my talk with her today, explains about what it was like for her to leave the organization and kind of land on earth, start her life anew, or really for the first time in the world as an adult. Here's the second part of my conversation with Hannah. So to go back, and there's so many things I want to come back to, go back to your your teenage years. That's when you, the trouble started, which is true for a lot of teenagers. Like, oh, oh that's, where, that's where everything started. It's true also that when you're in a restrictive environment, it does prompt people to sneak and yes. um, to need to do that because they can't be open about things. I mean, mm-hmm. it would have, I'm sure, been your preference if you could have said, hey, mom and dad, here's my boyfriend. And, you know could have invited him over to sit on the couch with you but yeah because that was not allowed the only way to get together was to sneak out which then became a source of shame and we weren't even supposed to even have crushes because we were if we had a crush on a boy that was a sinful emotion it was not allowed Mm -hmm. and also we were moving ahead of god's plan Mm -hmm. just magically at some point after we were done high school jesus would put a feeling of love in our heart for another man Mm -hmm. That's the way it was supposed to happen. So if we had crushes on boys in our teenage years, that was basically just lust and it needed to be dealt with quite harshly. Basically, we we were trained that those feelings are bad and to push them down. Mm -hmm. If you like someone like that, it's you're sinning. So that associated normal love that you Mm -hmm. might have for someone it had this awful guilty cloud around it, right? This, this shame around those regular feelings. And there was a whole ton of rules about couples that did get together. And then they had to, we called it walking out a year where they had to spend a year getting to know each other and always being covered as in they had to be someone with them at all times. They could never be alone. They could never touch. We had this joke that, they had to be six inches apart at all times. And then on their wedding day, when they the bride would walk down the aisle, the first time they were ever supposed to touch was when they held hands to say their vows. The first time they were ever supposed to kiss was their kiss when they were married. And I, I know of a story of a couple who made it through all of that 
on their wedding night, they're in a hotel room in Edmonton or somewhere. They were starting to make out for the first time as a married couple. And someone walked by their hotel room and they jumped apart. Mm -hmm. That Mm -hmm. guilt that followed them, even when they knew technically that what they were doing was now sanctioned suddenly, they couldn't get rid of that guilt. No, and the conditioning, you know, the fear being watched and the consequence of doing the wrong thing. Yeah. Intimacy between these couples was damaged for years. It took them years to get past that sense of shame every time they were together in an intimate way. I know I've talked to people who had no sex education and had heard and had grown up with their uh, their regular emotions also being demonized and criticized. And so when it came time to be intimate, um, yes, they couldn't get past a lot of the conditioned feelings, but they also didn't quite know what to do. <laughs> so there's the whole sort of practical aspect. Am I doing something wrong? Am I sinning? Am I making you sin? Am I hurting you? Am I, you know, I don't know, even just the mechanics, I don't know what to do. And then you're really kind of lost. Yeah. But then you're also, you've been trained as a, as a woman growing up, as a girl growing up, the man is the head of the household and your job is to be a help meet, which was a term we would use. You're supposed to be supporting him. Your job, your, your job as a woman is to support him, to raise his kids, to do everything you can to make sure he's successful spiritually and in life, which doesn't really leave room for you to be able to say no, or to say that doesn't feel good, or to say um, something about this doesn't feel right, or I need some time to myself, or I want to try this, or I want to do this thing that doesn't involve you, or whatever. There's no room in that um, spiritual ideal of marriage for a woman to have a voice. Mm -hmm. So when you raise a generation of women in this environment, and then suddenly you you send them out into the world, there's going to be some awful shit that goes down because you're get, you're sending these women out. To, I was sent out into the world without a voice. I didn't know I could say no. It didn't even occur to me that I could tell my boyfriend, uh, no, I don't feel like doing that tonight. Right. Yeah, exactly. If you can just spend a moment before we continue talking about sort of going out in the world, because I know there's a lot to your story, which is about that. Tell me just a little bit about the group itself and that you were saying that they were preparing for the end of the world. That also is something that can make people very fearful growing up. Like, when is that going to happen? And am I going to hasten it because of my behavior or whatever else? Sometimes that's tied in. So what were the thoughts around the end of the world and what was going to make it happen and what was going to happen to you and when it was going to happen? So my impression is that Sam Fife had a five-year plan. I don't really know much about it beyond the fact that he thought we would be there in the woods worshiping Jesus for five years and then Jesus was going to come back, find his 144,000 faithful, which relates to a scripture verse in Revelations, I think. And then that would be that, and it would be over. So he had this five-year plan. So kind of hilarious, some of the the construction and like the plan for laying out the farms and whatnot, they didn't really care how well-built it was. It just had to last for five years. And Jesus would be returning anyways, so who cares if that floorboard was going to fall through, you know, or whatever. Oh, yeah, that's not good. So then as time went on, I think my parents ended up, their first farm they were at, I think we're in 1973, they moved there. So there was, after five years, man, it was still going on. And then I think they kind of switched to the Y2K thing. Uh And that's because I was older then. So I kind of had this understanding of Y2K. And our farm bought some big, huge barrels of beans and rice to store the root cellar for Y2K. They were, my father was cautiously optimistic about Y2K. He was not going to put himself on the line and say, Jesus is returning. But he's like, it would be a good idea. This would work out really nicely for timing if Jesus decided to return for Y2K. In 2000, I was 20. I had these these thoughts at 16, 17 about leaving, leaving the farm. 
Mm-hmm. And then I would think, but if I'm in town and Y2K happens, how do I get back to the farm? When when the apocalypse ha- happens, you know, or I would have thoughts if I had a crush on a boy, like, well, I'm 17. I really like this guy. Will I even be able to get married and have kids before Y2K? You know, I just kind of assumed everything was going to end at that point. So there was a lot of fear around, okay, I need to just stay put and ride it out until then, which I think a lot of people were experiencing too. Yeah, a lot of fear. And then it it kind of um, propelled people, I think, to have that be part of their future planning. And so you had to factor in the end of the world coming, which people don't usually necessarily have to do when they're thinking about their future. Uh, but just how long you have before that ends and are things worth it to pursue because it's going to be ending. Okay. So that's very interesting. And then why 2 k So the, so the, um, you know, switch over the new millennia and the world is still here. What was the explanation? Was there an explanation? Well, you know, Jesus does things in his own time and who are we as mortal men to know what is in the mind of God. But the whole idea of Y2K was also used from the pulpit as an opportunity to recommit, to recommit your life to being, to living in this holy way so that all your ducks are in a row. So should Y2K happen, you've already sorted it all out. The lead up to that was used, yeah, sort of as a recommitment to the faith. Yeah. There, there are a lot of stories uh, that I've heard about that time where, um, People sold things, they gave away property, they signed over their property to groups. They were told that they could save the world from ending if they gave over more money or what, or recommitted in that way or brought in new members. It was really used in so many ways by so many groups. And I think that uh, once things um, didn't happen, once bad things didn't happen, some people really did believe the message that, well, you know, God or Jesus works in mysterious ways, or it's because I did this that I was able to keep the world afloat and keep it going. And other people said, uh, you know, they, they, people, you know, groups lost numbers because of that too. Like they just thought it was for lack of a better term BS. But um, I'm curious also about the speaking in tongues and the, the casting out of demons um, because that's something just, psychologically that has certainly an impact on people and there's something very kind of hypnotic about it uh and intense about it and then I want to go back to the timeline of you leaving so if you don't mind talking about those two things that would be great it's interesting I was talking to my sister about talking to you and she sent me this article that Yanya Lalich posted somewhere about behavioral controls within cults and we were going through it line by line being like oh my goodness Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. These all are applicable to, to what we experience. So one of the things on there is induced dissociation or other altered states by putting a person in a mild form of trance. So that speaks to the speaking in tongues for sure. And then there was this idea and Sam, Sam preached about demons a lot as these little things that enter our, our soul and keep us from fully pursuing God. So anything can be labeled a demon. Like my friend that had migraines, she was lazy. She had a demon of laziness. I had a friend who was told uh, she wore a lot of eyeliner and she had the demon of the sad eyes, like just ridiculous stuff. There was a woman on the farm who was this beautiful artist and she had done a lot of LSD before she moved to the farm. So she had all kinds of demons. When I look back, she just had done a lot of drugs and was still a little bit <laughs> not quite with it. It wasn't a demon. Anyways, Sam Fife had very famously cast all the demons out of this woman named Jane Miller. And there's a tape, um, the Jane Miller tape, it's called the Jane tape. And she was a woman with all sorts of psychiatric issues. Sam got a hold of her and prayed Jesus into her hard enough that Jane became our sort of traveling um exorcist for lack of a better term so jane would travel around to all the different farms she was scheduled to do these um deliverance services we called them and 
she was related to one of the head elders on my farm. So she came to my farm a lot, unfortunately for me. <laughs> this was a terrifying experience. When we all knew Jane was coming, the spotlight was on everybody. Everyone's behavior was looked at. If you had a bad attitude, well, Jane's coming. You can probably get that demon cast out of you. And all of us, there was about seven girls on the farm around my age, a little bit older, a little bit younger. And this one time before Jane came, we were all approached individually, either by our parents or elders. And it was explained to us which demons we had and that it was probably a good idea to have Jane pray for us at the deliverance service. So most of my friends, being good little Moveites that they were, signed up for this. So they, the night of the deliverance service, there's a chair that's put at the front of the church and the person who's going to be prayed for sits in it. And we all stand around as the congregation and we sing and we praise and Jane casts this demon out of this person. And these services can go on from after dinner to the wee hours of the morning till everyone in the audience is hoarse from, from singing. Wow. And Jane is, was this very charismatic, powerful woman. She had a voice like a smoker. So she just sounded authoritative. Mm -hmm. And she would start praying and she'd speak in tongues to this person and she'd lay hands on them and she'd shake their head. And it would generally, it would just gradually work its way up. We would be praying harder and singing harder and saying the same lines over and over again. And Jane would be speaking, like yelling into this person's ear. And they would be crying and praying and speaking in tongues and humiliating themselves in front of the entire farm. And eventually something would happen and the demon would come out or there would be like reach this climax and then it would all dissipate. And then the next person would come sit in the chair and they'd start the process all over again. And you're supposed to come out of that feeling cleansed of all your demons. So a lot of people who I know have been put in situations like this, uh, even just um, needing to do things, I'm thinking in Scientology where you're sitting in a room for hours and hours and hours, and you know, sometimes you, you just want it to be done. So you just say, okay, I'm going to go along with this and have it be where the demon is cast out because I'm exhausted. Uh, and so I wonder if that's something that was true for you or other people you knew where they just wanted the whole process to be finished, where it wasn't really a success. Yeah. They just needed for it to end. Yeah. And I, I mean, I can't speak to that personally because I chose not to sit in the chair. Just thinking about that. I'm just thinking about one night in particular, when we had this service, the, the physical tension within my body is still with me today in the sense that I knew I had said no to the chair. So that was a huge, put me in the spotlight. Hannah is so rebellious and so backslidden. Mm. She won't even sit in the chair. So I knew that the only way, my way of atoning for not sitting in the chair was to pray and sing as hard as I could and to, by all appearances, be as into this event as I possibly could. I needed to close my eyes. I needed to dance in the spirit. I needed to do everything I could to show how committed I was and how close I was to God in this moment. Otherwise, they probably would have grabbed me and hauled me into the chair against my will. Like that was my fear, right? Um, the idea of people faking it just to get it over with, that did happen with speaking in tongues. It was it was a a sign of how holy you were or how good your walk with God was. If you could speak in tongues, that was a big milestone. And it happened, you know, usually to young kids or teens once they sort of grasped the concept. And one by one, all of my friends were prayed over or they just suddenly walked into the tabernacle one day and said, oh, guess what? I can speak in tongues. I got blessed by the Holy Spirit. And it never happened to me. And I ended up being by the time I was 16, I was the only kid on the farm that didn't speak in tongues. And when people, when certain charismatic leaders would come through, mm -hmm. I would pretend I was speaking in tongues mm -hmm. in church because I didn't want them to look around and see, oh, what is that girl doing not speaking in tongues when everyone else is? 
Mm-hmm. I was so afraid of being singled out because I'd seen this happen over and over. People getting singled out, hauled up to the front, mm-hmm. just all of their sins exposed to the whole community. I was terrified of that happening. So I faked it. Mm-hmm. I faked it and faked it. And I got to um, a youth camp once when I was about 16. And I finally I just worked up the nerve and said, okay, I'm going to go up to the front. I'm going to kneel down and I'm going to speak in tongues or I'm going to die trying. And I was the last kid up there, snotty, crying in front of all of my peers, trying so hard, just like straining. I didn't know what to do. <sighs> and everyone was praying and like, what's going on? What's happening to Hannah? My dad even came up at one point and was talking to the elder who was praying over me. And the elder's like, she's trying to speak in tongues. And my dad, you know, he comes into the huddle and starts praying too. Never happened. I walked away from that, just humiliated, so embarrassed, just among my peers that I can't speak in tongues. But also, what is wrong with me? Yeah. You know, why is God not moving in me the way he is with anyone else? Everyone around me has this ability except for me. What does this mean? Well, it turns out years later, in speaking with my friends, most of them were faking it. They got to the point where they were so terrified of being singled out that they just decided to fake it. But I didn't know that. We didn't talk about that. That moment when I walked away unsuccessful was probably the pivotal moment of me leaving. That's what started it. Like, okay, clearly I am defective in a way that this life is not for me. And I also did not want to feel as awful about myself ever again as I did in that moment. Okay, there's so much to respond to with that. One is there are people who probably were speaking in tongues, whatever that means to them. And they were genuinely doing it. There are some people who are more susceptible, more hypnotizable, actually, than others. And so it's just good to know that there's always going to be a spectrum within a room and within an organization. And people who can just enter in a certain way of behaving and thinking that merges with the people around them or with uh, the power of suggestion. Uh, And also because they want it so badly, they want to have that, uh, the spirit in them and they want to have that um, communication back and forth. So they are open to it. Right. And then there are the people who are somewhere in the middle. They can get kind of lost and in the fervor of it, which I think is true for all of us mm-hmm. uh, at different times. But like your friends, they knew that the social, they were sort of responding to the social pressure rather than theology, that they had to sort of behave a certain way to pass. Yes. <laughs> okay. And, and then you were given a hard time where I think actually what you were doing, this isn't to say anyone is better than anyone else, but you were saying, I don't, I can't produce something that feels false. Yeah. And I am who I am. And this is something I can't seem to do because I am grounded. I mean, I think I see it as sort of a grounding Mm, I can't produce something that's not real. I'm, I'm not going to pretend. But those are the times that you realize you're, that you you have certain strengths, but in those organizations and in those moments are seen as weaknesses. And it doesn't surprise me that in that moment, that was sort of the beginning of you leaving because those, that, that personality actually is often the catalyst for the people who leave sooner than later. Well, Like we talked about the subtle forms of rebelling. I would go put jeans on, blue jeans on under my skirt and go sit in the forest, go way out into the forest and take my skirt off and sit on a tree stump in my blue jeans and just sit there and feel like the biggest badass in the world because there I was in my jeans, which I wasn't supposed to wear outside the house. But I, like my sister and some of the other girls on the farm, they were conformists. That's, that was how they got through those difficult events. They did what was expected of them. Whether it was fake or not, they conformed. Yeah. And the pressure was taken off of them. But as I came barreling through my teen years, I chose to just, this is me. You know, I, I, I wouldn't conform. I was very rebellious. Everyone knew I was the bad egg. And I 
was saying without being conscious of it, this is me. Why can't you love me as I am? What is so wrong with me just in my natural state that I'm just I'm not fitting in? And I just, I refused to, to conform. And that friction just got worse and worse and worse and worse to the speaking in tongues event to eventually just realizing, okay, this is just not for me. I need to go, you know, somewhere I belong. Okay. So I want to hear about that. I was curious also when they talk to people about their demons, what was your demon? If you don't mind me asking, I usually have never asked someone that question before. What's your demon? I'm trying to actually remember. I'm sure it had some form of rebellion. I think it was a demon of rebellion. My sister has this letter of when she was like 10. She was writing to a pen pal. And she said, as a 10 year old, we need to pray for Hannah. Um, she's got, she's had a bad attitude. Oh. <laughs> so I might've had the demon of bad attitude. Right. Yeah. And it, bad attitude is probably independent thought, you know? Yeah. And it's not like I was, I wasn't a violent kid. Right. Oh, yeah. I, I wasn't doing anything beyond pushing my boundaries and being a normal kid. Right. I mean, if you were a badass for just sitting in jeans doing nothing, then yes, no, that's not my kid at all. Uh, yes, right. And yet that was the worst thing I could think of to do in the moment, you know? Yeah. Okay. So here, suddenly you are 18 when you leave? Yeah. And so what happened? Do you remember that day? So both figuratively and literally between my farm and town was this little community that was associated with the move. It was a farm technically, but it was they had a business on the highway. They had um, a little motel and a little cafe. And then behind the business was just like a little trailer court where all the people live. So the way I left was I moved to that little halfway community. And their rules were a lot more lax than the farm um, because it was much closer to town. They had more access to town. Pe- everyone had jobs. And I wasn't under my parents' roof with the same adults that were like breathing down my neck. And then I worked, I worked at the the little cafe and made some money and just lived there for a little bit. First, I lived with a family there, um, shared a room with one of their, with their daughter. And then I moved in with one of the other single girls. And that was my first taste of freedom because then there was no one Mm -hmm. giving me rules about when I had to be back and what time I had to do whatever. Um, And then I got a job offer in town. So I lived on the the little halfway farm, mm-hmm. went, drove to town every day. My dad gave me a car. I drove to town every day. And then I met people there at work and I slowly started <laughs> sowing my wild oats and experiencing a different world and making mm-hmm. friends with some of these girls at the office that I worked at. I was driving, I went for lunch, I went to Wendy's one day with one of the girls um, in the office and we were driving around eating our burgers and she said, hey, do you like counting crows? And I I was like, mm-hmm. I kind of knew she was asking me something that I didn't know about, mm-hmm. but I said, I was like, yeah, I, I do that sometimes, uh-huh. I guess. And she's like, no, it's a band, counting crows. I did. I had no idea. Uh-huh. But very slowly, my education right. of the greater world began. And then eventually I got an apartment in town and my exit was complete. Amazing. And so <laughs> I love that story about counting crows because I was thinking, yeah, you're going to visualize counting crows. I mean, it's not like an exciting activity, but yeah, I must. Yes, if there's crows. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. But what was your parents' reaction just as you're going through this transitional space? I mean, your dad gave you a car, which is great, but were they worried about you? Did they think you had fallen? Did they understand what you were doing? It was interesting because my father bucked the trend and he always wanted my sister and I to go to university. That was one of his biggest goals for us before we ever got married. He wanted us to pursue higher education. I think because that was such a big goal for him you know, that was his way of coming into his own when he was that age. And my mom supported that too. She didn't really say much. They also saw me after I was finished high school, sitting on the farm, I would sit in my room and like crochet or just read books. I had nothing to do with my time in that in-between phase of 
finishing high school and getting married. So they knew that I needed to go spread my wings. Okay. And they also didn't think I was going to go be drinking and carrying on in town. They just thought I'd be a good little girl and come back for church every Sunday. Mm, Okay. So they were supportive, but there was adults on the farm that kind of stopped talking to me. I would come home. I did come home every Sunday um, for dinner with my parents and they didn't quite know how to communicate with me anymore because I wasn't, you know, Mm. they weren't quite sure what I was doing, if I was still safe or not, you know, or right. How backslidden I was and if that would get on them accidentally, you know, to get some splash back. Right. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. That does happen. Like it's contagious. Uh, but here, when you would go back on Sundays, then you would dress the part and yeah, I would put a skirt back on and just out of respect, it took me a long time to ever go back to the farm wearing pants. I felt very exposed on the farm if I wore pants. Right. Okay. So here you're in, you're in an apartment for the first time. Yeah. Everything was new. Mm -hmm. It was this whole other world that I hadn't ever experienced. I kind of understood, like I knew what beer was and I knew what partying and, you know, it wasn't like I was that isolated, but to finally, I had TV for the first time. Mm -hmm. I started watching commercials that, and then when someone would say, Oh, did you see that funny commercial? Mm -hmm. I would know what they were talking about for the first time. Right. Okay. And how did you explain? I'm sure there were times that you didn't know things still and people were surprised that you didn't know them. So did you feel like you needed to explain why that was? I would do my best to avoid it. Okay. Um, I would either keep silent, but I also, throughout being on the farm, growing up the way I did, I developed a hypervigilance that you wouldn't believe. So I was able to, I would constantly be watching everyone around me. I would be listening. I was able to absorb an enormous amount of data about society and the world around me just through observation. So I would be able to, I wasn't oblivious to what was going on. If someone had a conversation about a commercial, I would know about that enough to be able to say something or flub it off, you Mm -hmm. know, squeak Mm -hmm. my way through that conversation. Okay, right. Okay, that's good though, that you didn't have all these moments where you just felt like you had to admit being a fish out of water or feeling like a fish out of water. Okay. Yeah, no, and I, I fell in with this really kind of rowdy, sort of rough crowd. I mean, this was amazing to me. They were really accepting. They were nothing like what I was told the people out in the world would be like. You know, I assumed from the moment I stepped off the farm, people would be after me for every last thing they could get out of me. If you broke down on the side of the road, no one was going to stop by and help you. You would be just raped within an inch of your life every time you turned around as a woman because people were mean. They would not have the time of day for you. You, would, you were on your own. That's what we were taught. And then I moved into town and there was this rough, like heavy duty mechanic crowd that I fell in with. And they were all just salt of the earth, genuine people. If I had a flat, one time I locked my car, my keys in my car on a lunch hour and I could phone somebody. And he came over right away and he was super nice and he helped me out. And it started to blow apart all of these things I had been taught. And, but every time something nice happened, it filled me with this sense of wonder that this world was just not as scary and as bad. And every day I didn't end up in hell was one more day of, oh, okay, so maybe this isn't all bad. Maybe I can have a good life outside of living this restricted particular way. Right. Wow. So maybe I won't end up in hell. So that was something originally, or soon after you left, that you were still worried about day by day. Yeah. And it took me a few years to not to not have those dark moments where I, I remember having like a boyfriend a, a couple of years after I left and one night breaking down and crying and being worried that if we didn't get married, pretty soon, you know, the time was running out. I would go to hell because we had moved in together. We were living together in sin. And I had a genuine worry that I was going to go to hell. I wasn't completely sure, but I was pretty sure. And that took a long time to wear off. Right. To, to the, to finally realize, okay, I'm probably not going to go to hell 
for loving somebody. <laughs> right. That shouldn't be evil uh, or seen as evil. I wanted to go back to what you were talking about, about expressing yourself and having a voice and being able to say no. How did that impact you? And how did you start to learn about how to use your words to protect yourself? That has been a very long process. I spent, I think, a solid year, not too long ago, in counseling, some really intense sessions. Like I think it was every other week in counseling Mm. and talked through a lot of this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And it took someone telling me, okay, you know, that thought pattern is not normal. That thought pattern is not healthy for you. What if we reframe that? Like breaking everything down in counseling Mm -hmm. and learning. Um, One of the things she taught me was how to be my own parent. Mm. How to love myself in the way that I needed my parents to love me, which was unconditionally. And that was that was such a novel concept for me, but as soon as I got it, it blew a lot of that other stuff away. Mm. I could celebrate myself for who I was. I wasn't a bad person. And being able to tell myself that as my own parent went a long way towards filling that void. And then once you, once I started being able to celebrate myself and my own accomplishments, you know, when I got a car, when I got a good job, when I could look around my apartment and it, I had a couch and I had a bed and I paid my bills on time. These are all things that I still celebrate because I was told once that that was not ever going to happen and that I would be bad at it and it would be a miserable experience because it wasn't part of God's plan for my life. But once you, once I started to love myself in that way, a lot of this other stuff sort of fell into place too. There is something powerful about that where people are not afforded that opportunity in groups that want to control them. Uh, the unconditional part then keeps you from feeling like you need to follow their rules uh, in order to be a good person or in order to love yourself. So if you take, if you switch the equation, then yeah, people who want to control you find that threatening. Um, but then in the world outside, it's very empowering. And you can also then find out about yourself in a way that you couldn't before. Are you someone without the rules that you were given in the group? Are you still a trustworthy person? Are you still a good person, a kind person, right? And when you find out that you didn't need all of that structure um, in order to keep yourself on the on a good path or to be a good person, it can be really very um, empowering and create a lot of good confidence that a lot of people don't get an opportunity to have. Well, and when you start when you start to genuinely learn how to love yourself in a healthy way, you are able to enter be in a situation that doesn't feel good and be able to say, "Mm, this doesn't feel good to me. This is not making me feel the way I want to feel right now. So I need to get myself out of it or I need to say no to it. And you have, you have to learn to honor yourself in that way and treat yourself as if you deserve you. If it doesn't feel good, you shouldn't have to do it. You are worthy of of being able to say, nope, that doesn't feel good. I'm okay without that. Right. As you're developing that, and yes, that does take some time, and you can still find that you have to sort of push through the wall uh, yeah. and voicing your opinions and dissenting views and um, saying no. It still seems like you were able to make connections that felt good and safe with people who made you feel good and safe. And so then you didn't have to feel like you had to defend yourself at every moment which is good you know yeah but there's a lot of this this process too um it's hard to verbalize because it was so subconscious too you don't realize how much your brain has shifted and changed and how your thought patterns have have totally shifted you're not necessarily super conscious of that until you come up to a situation where you're reminded of how far you've come with all of this beautiful positivity and learning to love myself, some of the things that helped me the most too were coming up against either my parents in a situation or I would run into someone from the move and be completely reminded like, 
oh my God, uh, now I remember that sort of shame and guilt Mm -hmm. and I am not that person anymore. And I can't believe, like, it was just shocking how, how stark the difference was between seeing where they were still in their life and their judgments and how far I had come where none of that stuff really even, not only did it not resonate with me as truth, it was so far removed from anything I would consider good. You know, my friends got married. So there was a lot of farm people at this wedding because that's where we were all from. Mm-hmm. And we were just sitting around having a good old time. And one of the ladies from another farm came up and like crouched down by my chair. So Hannah, how's your spiritual walk these days? And what, what church are you attending down there in Vancouver now? Like just the audacity of someone to come up and and try and speak so deeply into my life without having said hi to me for the last 10 years. Right. Yeah. Like we're at very different places, you know, that it, it showed me how far we, and I knew if I told her, um, I actually don't go to church anymore. She would have just been horrified. Right. So what did you say? Um, I, I don't even remember. I think I just sort of said something like, Oh, you know, here and there, you know, I'm still, still looking for, for fit, a good fit, you know, cause I was actually, I did when I moved to Vancouver, look for a community. I went to a few different churches just to try them out and see how they felt. Cause I missed, like, I, I still wanted that sense of home and that sense of community. That was one of the biggest griefs in leaving that was giving all that up. Cause you, I mean, you leave your whole family and that sense of warmth. Yeah. Right. I I want to go back to that. Um, but after responding to this woman crouching down and asking you about that, that happens a lot where people are, will run into people from their organization and they get questions. And they know that based on the answer, they're going to either, uh, the other person will find it acceptable or um, they'll have some criticism around it. And then that information is also going to be shared with everyone who's still involved in the group or their family still involved in the group. So nothing's private. And so there is, as you say, this audacity, this kind of entitlement, you know, I, I have the right to ask you this very personal question and judge you based on your answer. Um, what's also true is that just because someone asks you a question doesn't mean you have to answer it, which is sort of this novel idea, right? Because uh, that was never um, that was never afforded uh, to you before. You did have to answer, and here, if you're just sort of hemming and hawing, and uh, I'm I'm doing this or not, <laughs> that that's okay because you have the right to your information. Yeah. That's your personal life, and just because someone wants to know what's happening in your personal life doesn't mean you have to tell them. Yeah, it's interesting as you're talking. Because there's there's part of me when I told you just told you that story, this idea that I was a little disappointed that I didn't have my firm voice yet. I wasn't able to tell her, you know what? That's none of your blankety blank business. Uh-huh. Go away. Right. Yeah. Now that's what I would want to say, but me hemming and hawing was such a progress from where I would have just answered her blank, you know, just, oh, you want to know something, I need to tell you everything, because you have a right to know everything about my life. But even just being able to hem and haw and kind of flub the truth a little bit was progress for me. I was protecting myself. Yeah. And even that was, I don't know, that was like five years after I had left. And so that was the stage I was at, you know, mm-hmm. it took five years for me to even just be able to kind of stutter. Mm-hmm. But I was still using my voice in a way. Yes. Yes, you were, and not giving, I mean, yes, there, it is, it's done in stages, and what you want is to not be too harsh with yourself, that you have to rush it, that you're, you, when you have those moments, and you don't instinctively just offer over everything that's private, and you hold back a bit, that's huge, it might not seem huge in a moment, but it is huge. And then sometimes people get to a point where instead of answering the question, they respond to what the intention is of the question. Oh, I know you're concerned about me and, you know, because I'm not doing this anymore. And um, thank you so much for caring, even though it might not be coming from a caring place. But you sort of turn it back on what you think the intention was still without answering the question. 
And then you end the conversation because I think that's the other part that when you're raised in a, in a controlling environment, you're not used to having control over the content of a conversation and where it goes and also when it ends. And being able to just decide the conversations over is also really huge. I think people don't realize that. That you can say, okay, and, and good to see you. And you still have an answer to the question. Uh, and then again, if the person doesn't leave, you know, very nice to see you. I'm going to go back to doing what I was doing before. And that you really can control that. This is why I really like emails and phone calls. Because phone calls, <laughs> you just hang up. Uh-huh. <laughs> And then call back later and apologize, but you can hang up and end the conversation if you need to. And emails, I've always been good at speaking my truth. I was curious if there is, if there have been people you've reconnected with or other parts of your life that you want to make sure to let people know about that are telling from your experience or that have taught you a lot um, as you move forward in the world. Yeah, like what comes to mind first when you say that is the first gay man I ever met when I moved to Vancouver. And of course, homosexuality was like the biggest sin. You know, these people from my, and still from my mother's perspective, are walking around just dripping in AIDS. Mm. If you associate with them, it'll probably rub off on you at some point. They are the fallenest of the fallen to be avoided at all costs. But Jesus loves them, but we don't need to associate with them. Even though Jesus loves them, we'll just leave that up to him. Mm. So when I first moved to Vancouver, one of the first people I met was this gay man. And he was the warmest, nicest, most accepting person. He had lost his family because he was gay. Mm. And I had lost my family because I was choosing not to continue with that, the lifestyle I was raised in. And the more time I spent with him, it was just one more incident of all of that, all of those shells of what I was told just falling away. And I continued to meet along my path, more people like that who just meet you and accept you for who you are. Like you just let your freak flag fly Uh and the people that like that will gravitate towards you. There's always going to be the people that think that you're an idiot or whatever, you know, people that you don't get along with in society. Mm -hmm. But slowly I have amassed this group of people around me who just, love me as I am. And there's not the guilt. There's not the shame. Mm-hmm. I could go have a one night stand and my girlfriends would high five me or whatever, you know, like it's a totally different idea. Like it, moving in with a boyfriend in my group of people that's celebrated as a sign of love, not as this shameful thing. Right. And it's taken years and years of being around these people to reinforce mm-hmm to all of these normal positive life things as opposed to the reinforcement I got from zero to 18 of how awful these things were. Right, right. Okay, okay. I, it is very surprising when you come across when you're talking about sort of meeting the first gay man that you met, uh, which is actually probably not even the case because there were probably gay men and women on the farm. Uh, who couldn't be there were actually yeah there was one there was one actually um I had a conversation with her a while ago she lives um in Van- Vancouver Island now mm-hmm. and she told me after my father died a few years ago that she had had this huge conversation with him when she came out mm-hmm. and she was asked to leave the farm because she came out and she tried mm-hmm. to have a conversation with the elders and my dad included that Jesus can love me even if I'm gay and I can still be a Christian. I can still have a moral framework around my life. I can still Mm -hmm. not believe in premarital sex. I can still follow God's teachings and be gay. And they would not accept that. So it was an opportunity. I'm so glad after he died that she, she Facebooked me or something. And I was able to say to her, I do not follow my father's teachings especially in that way. And I just want you to know that, like I will distance myself from that by saying, I love you and accept you as you are. This is how we do it now. All of us ex movites. I love it. Okay. That's a beautiful way, I think, to, to end our conversation. Uh, and I'm so glad that 
you made the time to be able to talk to us and share your your stories. I know there are hundreds more, I'm sure. Uh, but to to give a sense of sort of coming um, coming into your own and realizing who you are and who you can be and and how you can be seen by others. And having this idea that I think a lot of people don't get a chance to have that it doesn't have to be either or, it can be both and, that you can be out of the group and still happy and still safe and still a good person. Yeah, and there's, there's an interview that Tara Westover did with Oprah. She wrote um, Educated, Tara Westover. Mm -hmm. um, and she talked about her restrictive upbringing and she said, basically, this is my paraphrasing, two opposite things can be true at the same time. She loves her father very much, but she also knows that she can love and not be part of that and to reject his way of life and all of his teachings. And that's perfectly fine. You can still have love for those people. You can still have some sort of affinity to the lifestyle that you were raised in, but also know that's not healthy for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you have the right to do that you have the power to do that and it it doesn't mean that then everything is going to go to hell <laughs> or that you're going to go to hell right okay everything can turn out perfectly fine yeah right isn't that <laughs> nice isn't that nice to find that out that's really wonderful okay good well, good good so thank you again and i uh hope to talk to you again and if there are any other thoughts or stories that come to mind be in touch okay sounds good you take care Okay, you too. One more thing before you go. I am so very happy you had a chance to hear the second part of my conversation with Hannah. There was something at the end of Hannah's talk today where she talked about transitioning out of her community and she mentioned that she was told she would be in danger if she lived in the world, only to find out that the people she came across were much more kind and helpful and accepting than she had been made to feel. And then she mentioned in an offhand comment that it was after she left that she met the first gay man she had ever met who had also lost his family. So whether or not that was the first gay man she had met, and I, I doubt it was, but probably just the first one who had been able to be out to her, it struck me that she said that he had lost his family. It made me think about all the people out there who you know. And some of you are those people who I'm referring to, who by virtue of the decisions that you have made or the way you have been born, you are disenfranchised. You are cast out, seen as having something wrong with you, sidelined from your family, your community, from the mainstream, and shamed, just like it still is with people who are gay and they're made to feel in certain arenas that they're going to be more easily seen as a danger to others, as a danger to children, or that they shouldn't be parents. As though being gay, or in Hannah's case, just shifting your belief system from one to the other, suddenly interrupts or inhibits your ethical code and keeps you from having a moral center. The two are completely unrelated. I have heard discussions where people have told others that they are agnostic or atheist, and the retort has sometimes been, well, then what stops you from doing something wrong if you don't believe in God? And how do you know what's right and what's wrong? And I've always found that baffling because people who believe in God know what hurts them and upsets them, and then they know they shouldn't do those things to other people. And people who don't believe in God also know what hurts them and upsets them and knows that they shouldn't do these things to other people. But that for some people who just do the right thing, no matter if they think someone is watching or not, somehow they are guided by an internal locus of control. It doesn't matter if they're going to get busted for doing the wrong thing. They use their conscience as their guide. But I digress. Going back to what Hannah said, that this man had mentioned he had lost his family, it reminded me of all the shunning and disconnection you hear about in different groups and communities and how people are really cast out in so many ways that leave them isolated and alone. But I've also found so often that the people who have been pushed out are often ones when I come across them who are lovely and who are just searching 
and who are trying to be their true selves and have been through the ringer and who are trying to live authentic lives with honesty and with a lot of courage. And we're not willing to be pressured into living a life that felt like a lie, and we're not willing to live a life of secrecy. It's about having that internal guide that can propel you forward into the world, but sometimes has you spin out on your own, out of the vortex that is the life that you knew and the family that you once belonged to. I see some of these people who have been pushed out and are spinning out on their own, who live in an isolated way, sometimes for a very long time, but also sometimes something fortuitous and beautiful happens, that they meet each other at a place like the support group I have in my office, for example, or at a conference for people who have been through similar kinds of traumas or changes, or they just find each other on the street and start sharing a living space together, a loft, an abandoned whatever, and they take care of each other and create a sense of family. And while it doesn't replace their family of origin entirely in their heart, it does give them a sense of community and family that can be crafted, that is usually much more of an unconditionally loving family that helps to feed and heal their soul in so many ways. And it's in those moments when people do feel accepted and acceptable and unconditionally loved that they're able to feel more emotionally safe with others and confident. But in conditionally loving families, members are sometimes seen as disposable and expendable in ways that can seem suddenly shockingly unemotional. I've heard this far too often, that the message conveyed to my clients was you are expendable because you bring shame to us and we can't have that. So instead of us finding a way to see you as having nothing inherently wrong with you and love you no matter what, no matter what our community tells us to feel about you too, we will do the thing that is kind of easier for us that we've been trained to do that doesn't challenge us or our beliefs. And we will just cut you off and cut you out and try to forget. So if people are able to remember that when they're pushed out and seen as sometimes dead to their families, and they say about themselves or feel about themselves that they have lost their family, I really wish they were able to see that the loss was their families, that their family lost them. Coming from my own family, with children and relatives who are trans and who are along the spectrum of everything but who make the family what it is and give it the richness that it has, where each person has their place and is loved, I am still shocked, maybe it's naive, by the stark contrast I see with other families and with some of my clients' families, by the cruelty and sometimes just the disinterest. The disinterest in really knowing them and in learning more and gaining greater understanding and the immediacy of the punitive reaction that comes from fear or from years of emotional or spiritual teachings, which results in an automatic casting out rather than a gathering in. There are some families or members of families who reach out to those who have been pushed out when they see that what they did automatically without thinking was not really what they had wanted to do at the time, but they couldn't say anything. And they're missing their loved one tremendously, and they really want to regain a connection and make up for lost time. But for others who are pushed out and who are not approached by family, and they're not reconnected with, and for all those who are in that situation now, it is their family's loss. They are the ones losing time with you. They're losing a life with you. They're missing out on moments. They're missing out on having a connection and a relationship and having you still be able to participate and share your love and share your care towards them. And the most baffling part of all of this is it's usually not personal, even though it feels tremendously personal. I remember meeting an older man who was a client who was at a social service agency I worked at in New York. He was sad and was lamenting about how lonely he was and that he had no family left. So I thought the obvious. I thought he meant that they had all passed on and I was feeling quite sorry for him. 
But then as I heard him tell his stories to some of the other people there, he had three children who were all still living, actually nearby. One who just did not go into the family business as his father had wanted him to so he could retire and know that he could pass it along to his eldest son. So he rejected him from the family for being a disappointment. And he had two daughters, one who married a man of a different race who was then cut off from the family, and another who was raising her children with her wife. And that entire family was cut out. And here, this man was sitting alone when he didn't have to be. It was his loss. And all these losses, I think, were unnecessary. And it seemed that he still believed he was right to make these decisions, whether that was true or not, or pretense or defensiveness. But he genuinely seemed disappointed by all of them and believed they had failed him and that it was important to teach them all a lesson because he was upholding his standards. But then, sadly, his sense of righteous indignation became his only companion. Talk to you next week. I'm excited to say that this podcast is now available on additional platforms. If you want to listen to Indoctrination, it's available for download on the NPR Radio Public app, YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and more. Please support Indoctrination at patreon.com slash indoctrination. We now have a big library of content that you can access with any donation. And subscribers receive bonus interviews and other cool goodies. We love hearing from you too. So send us an email at indoctrinationshow at gmail.com. Thank you for your support.